Hey everybody, welcome back to Complex Analysis. So today we're going to continue our topology talks. Remember last time we gathered a bunch of terms and everything. And um, again, what I said in the last video, and I still think it holds true, is that a lot of these things that we're discussing I think are somewhat intuitive, but we're given sort of a mathematical precision or preciseness to them. So remember last time we talked about a couple of things. We talked about one, um, interior points. which again, that's kind of like points that are inside of the set, they're not at the boundary, and then we have boundary points. Okay, which are points that are on the boundary of a set. And then we had things that are isolated points, which again, kind of like it says in the name, they're sort of by themselves. I so that's not as well isolated points. Um, and then we talked about the idea of open sets, this should be number four open sets so a set is open if all of its points are interior points closed sets sets that contain their boundary points and so on and so forth so again a lot of these terms I think they're somewhat intuitive especially these three um, and then we gave them a, a little bit of mathematical precision for instance interior points we would say that a, a point is an interior point okay like this point right here if there exists an open ball, okay, or an open disk that is uh, that is centered at this point, but it's still contained within our set G. Okay, boundary points like this point here are points that, if you take any open disk centered at them, you contain both a point inside the set and a point outside the set. Okay, which hopefully again sort of makes sense. That means you're on the boundary, right? You're like sort of at the the precipice, or you're you're at the end. Anything to this side, you're going to be out. Anything to this side, you're going to be in. Okay. And then isolated points, we have to actually, let's say, here's our imaginary and real axis. And let's say G also contains, let's say, a point out here. Then this would be an isolated point. Okay, And an isolated point, remember, it's a point for which if you, you can find an open disk centered at it, Okay, that only contains that point, but no other point in G. Okay. Um, so today, again, we're going to continue our topology talk with some more um, terms and definitions, which, again, I think are somewhat intuitive, but we're going to give them that mathematical precision, though. Okay, so bounded. Now, bounded, I think, again, that's one of those things, I think it sounds exactly like what it, what it means. A bounded set is just a set that's not shooting off to sort of one of the infinities, quote unquote. So for instance, something like this would be a bounded set. Something that would not be bounded would be something like this. So let's think about all the points that are below this dotted line here and then above or equal to this line right here. So all of this. So this would be something that's not bounded because we're going literally infinitely far to the right and infinitely far to the left. Okay. So again, I think bounded, again, is one of those things that it's intuitive. But how do we make it mathematically precise? Well, we give the following definition. Let me erase all this. Um, so we say that a set is bounded if there exists some open disk that contains it. Because we know open disks, they are bounded just by by sort of by construction. But in any case, again, we say set G is bounded if there exists some open disk for which our set is contained in that open disk. So for instance, for our set G up here, we could create the open disk with radius. There's actually infinitely many open disks that would work. But let's say the radius is, I don't know, yay big here, R. And so if we take this circle, which let's pretend like this is a perfect circle here. Notice that this open disk will actually contain G, so it is a bounded set. The next idea we're going to talk about is something called connectedness, which again, I think it's one of those intuitive things. Um, I like to think about connectedness as it's a set where all the points are somehow connected without any gaps in between them. Um, but in any case, let's make that more mathematically precise. So define two set, or given two sets X and Y, we say that they're separated if there are open sets A and B with X in the first one and Y in the second one for which A and B are disjoint. 
Okay, so let me give you a picture for that. So let's say this is x, and this is y. Okay, so I don't know why I wrote y like that, but in any case, let's say that's x and that's y right there. So hopefully you guys see these are these sets would be what we would call separated, okay? Because again, notice they, they are literally separated, right? So ha the, the definition here is saying, well, two sets are separated if we can find open sets. So let's say this is our open set A. And here's our open set B. Okay, that contain X and Y respectively, but A and B don't intersect. Okay, so given two sets X and Y, if we can find such sets A and B, okay, that are open and that are disjoint, but contain X and Y respectively, then we would say that X and Y themselves are what we call separated, okay? Now, why did I bring up this idea of separated? Well, this is kind of how we define connectedness. So we say G is, is connected if there does not exist two separated sets whose union is G, whose union is G, I should say. Okay, so again, let me say that again. We say that a set G is connected if there does not exist two separated sets whose union is G, okay? So for instance, let me give you an example of something that's not connected. So let's say G, and I'm trying to change the colors here. Let's say G is this set here and here. Okay, so let's say G is both of these things right here. And actually, I don't know why I wrote G twice. Then this is definitely not connected, right? Because we can call, let me use different colors here. Let's call this X. And let's call this over here Y. Then clearly X and Y are separated because we can find open sets that contain X and Y, whose union, or who's, who are disjoint. Um, and if I take the union of X and Y, notice G is the union of X and Y, okay? So G would not be connected. And I think, again, if you look at the picture, it's kind of obvious in a way, right? These are not connected sets. They're, they're, not, they're not glued together. It's different pieces. So another way you can sort of think about connected is it's a set that doesn't have pieces to it. It's sort of like all connected in one blob. And then lastly, we say a region, and this is what we're going to be considering a lot in complex analysis, a region is a connected open set. Okay, we're going to see that word a lot, but a region is a connected open set. Now, let me give you an example of another quote-unquote simple type of connected set, and that's what we call a path. All right, so paths are something that we have seen before. We've seen them in Calc 3. If you guys remember back in Calc 3, we would have functions like this. Sometimes we call them parameterizations. Um, but something like f of t is equal to 2t, whoops, and then maybe like t minus 2 or something like that. Um, another way of thinking about these, these are vector-valued functions. But in any case, we have seen this idea of a, of a path. And basically what a path is doing is it's sort of tracing out a, a curve in C. Okay, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, now, before we get to that, the precise mathematical definition of a path, a path or curve in C is a continuous function, gamma, from A, B to C, where A, B is a closed interval in R. Okay, so a simple example is, is this path right here. So 0 to 1, okay, or that's, that's our domain in that case, to C, where gamma of t is equal to ti. Okay, so let me just give you, let me just show you what this actually is doing here. So here's our real and imaginary axes. Okay, I'm going to use a different color for this. So what we're going to do, let's plug in some t values. So t and gamma. Okay. So time starts in this case at 0. So let's start with 0. So if I plug in 0, what do we get? We get 0. OK, so our path starts here. OK, now let's go further in time. So let's plug in, let's say, I don't know, 1 fourth 
Okay, and then what's gamma going to be? Gamma is going to be 1 fourth t. Whoops, 1 fourth i. There you go. I know that's a weird i, but in any case, 1 fourth i. So where is 1 fourth i? 1 fourth i is, let's say it's like right here. Okay. Let's go a little bit further in time. If we plug in 1 half, what do we get? We get 1 half i. So let's say that's about right there. And then finally, let's go ahead to the end here at 1. If I plug in 1, we just get i. OK, so this is what our path is doing. OK, it's starting it here at the origin, and it's just going up the imaginary axis until we get to i here, and then it stops. OK, so this would be right here, our path. Okay, now, this is a very simple example, but this is kind of what paths are doing. So again. Paths are sort of outlining or tracing some kind of curve. Whenever you put in a t value, you're saying this is where the curve is at at time t equal to, well, whatever you plugged in. So for instance, at time t equal to 1 half, the path was right here at this point. Okay, at time t equal to 1, our path was up here at i. At time t equal to 0, we were down here at the origin. So this is what paths are doing. Again, paths are sort of outlining or tracing some kind of curve in C. Okay. And again, same idea that you had back in Calc 3 with parameterized curves. Uh, vector valued functions are sort of a, a, a subset of this. But in any case, it is, it is something that you've seen, but we're just applying it to now complex numbers. Okay. Now, as you can see, by the way, notice this curve or this, this, if we consider this path here as a set, this is a connected set, right? It's completely connected. In fact, all, all points here are connected by if you want a, a straight line here or a vertical line. OK, so your book gives um, some slightly more complicated examples. I'm trying to erase. That's a spoiler. Oh, what happened? It's not letting me erase that. But anyway, in any case, that's OK. Um, so your book gives two examples of paths, gamma 1 and gamma 2 here. Um, let me go to gamma 2 because I think that's easier to see. But gamma 2 is doing the following. Okay, So notice it's a piecewise, quote unquote, linear function here. So the first piece, 3 plus i times t minus 2. And the second piece, 6 minus t plus i over 2, t minus 1. So what's happening with this curve here? Well, let's start at time t equal to 0. So if we plug in 0, we'll get gamma 2 of 0 is equal to 3 plus minus 2i, which written differently is just 3 minus 2i. So where is that in our complex plane? That's right here. Okay, So our gamma 2 curve is starting right here, t equal to 0. Okay. Now what happens if we plug in? Let's just do one more. Well, let's do two more. Gamma of 1, Okay. well, if we plug in 1, we're going to get 3 minus i. Okay. Now where is 3 minus i? 3 minus i will be pro approximately like right here. Okay. If we plug in 3, oops, still gamma 2. If I plug in 3, we're going to get, in this case, let's see, 3 plus i. And that'll land us right up here. Okay. So the first part of gamma 2 is starting here at this point at the bottom. And it's just going up vertically to this point right here. And then it switches curves. So if we plug in. 3 into the second piece, you'll see that we'll get the same point here. If we plug in 4, gamma 2 of 4, we're going to get, let's see, so if we plug 4 into this, we'll get 2 plus, let's see, 3i over 2, which is approximately right here. Okay, And if we plug in 5, you'll see that we get this point here. Okay, so gamma 2 is basically two lines glued together. We're starting here at this point here. We're going up. And then finally, we switch lines, and then we go up this way. Okay, and actually, let me erase that, because I don't want you thinking I drew a new curve there. I'm just trying to outline where it's going. Okay. 
Now, gamma 1 here is a little bit more um, geometric in a way. Notice we get a circular thing. And I just want to explain really quick why are we getting this circular thing. It's because of this 2e to the it. Now, remember that e to the it is not the normal exponential function that we had back in calculus. It's not e to the x or anything like that. So what I wrote here was for you that, uh, just a reminder, remember that e to the it on its own, let's not use green on green, e to the it on its own, remember that's equal to cosine of t plus i sine of t. Remember, mathematicians don't want to write out this whole thing, right? So we gave it this exponential notation. So 2e to the it would be 2 times this, which is what I have written in green here. Okay. Um, now, geometrically, what this is doing, this whole gamma 1 here, so notice we have negative 2 here, which is, well, negative 2 on the real axis. Okay. And then what we're adding to it is 2e to the it. Now, remember, exponential form, what this means is that we're adding points to it that have a radius 2. Okay. and who make an angle or argument, argument d. Okay. And remember, the argument is telling you what's the angle your point's making with the positive real axis. Okay. So again, what we're doing here, we're, we're at negative 2. You can think about this as we're centered at negative 2. And then te to the it is saying we're going two distance away from negative 2. Okay. And then we're going to have some kind of angular component to it. Now, what's the angular component? Well, that's what's given right here. Notice that t is going between pi over 2 and 2 pi, right? So pi over 2, that's a 90 degree angle. Okay, So that will be this point here. And then we're going to rotate all the way around to 2 pi. So that's what's giving you this nice circular region here. And then once we get to the origin, because that's 2 pi, we stop there. Okay, so gamma 1 is this circle. You can really think about this as a circle. Well, we'll put 3 fourths of a circle, because it's not the full circle, right? It's sort of starting at the top and then just rotating around. So 3 fourths of a circle of radius 2. And that's coming from this 2 right here. Centered at negative 2, which is coming from that negative 2 right there. Okay. Now, if you're a little bit uncomfortable with the geometry, remember you can always go back to your definition of your exponential function. And if you plug in t equal to pi over 2, let's say pi, 2 pi over 2, you know, plug in your nice angles in this interval here, you will see that you do get these points here. Okay. And you do get that circular shape. Okay. But I just wanted to remind you of that too. Because remember, that's, our, that's, our, um, that's how we defined our exponential notation there. In any case, these are the book's, books examples of two connected paths. OK, so we say that a path is smooth, okay, which should sort of make sense intuitively. Like smooth means that there's no jagged edges or any holes or anything like that. Okay, But in any case, how do we make that precise? We say a path is smooth if it is differentiable. Okay, So that gets rid of, remember, Remember the absolute value that's not differentiable at a point, right? That's getting rid of this case right here and is continuous and non-zero. So continuous is getting rid of this case right here. Okay, So a path is smooth if it is differentiable and its derivative is continuous and non-zero. Okay. Actually, der derivative also does take this point into, or the whole into account anyway. But um, anyway, uh, note. So we use similar definitions for continuity and differentiable. We actually haven't talked about differentiable functions yet, right, or continuous functions. But the way we define differentiable paths and continuous paths is very similar to what we would do in calculus. So we say that a path is continuous at some point t0 if this limit here exists. So the limit as t approaches t0 of gamma of t is equal to gamma of t0. Similarly, the derivative of gamma at some point is defined very similarly. So gamma prime of t naught. This is equal to the limit as t approaches t naught of the difference quotient. So gamma of t minus gamma of t naught over t minus t naught. Okay. So again, 
Just to summarize, we say a path is smooth if it's differentiable and its derivative is also continuous. And just, just um, intuitively, you can think about smooth paths as, again, paths don't, that don't have these, these sharp edges or holes or anything like that. And the last thing we're going to talk about is orientation. So we've kind of already been hitting at this with all the examples of paths we've been talking about. But paths come with this natural orientation. And an orientation is just how is the path moving? How is the path flowing? If you think about this path as, as sort of like a river, which way is it going? So for example, if we go back to our circle, so here was negative 2. We started, well, actually, let me adjust that a little bit. I'm going to change our angles a little bit. So consider that circle that we were just talking about, except now we're going to be, and actually, did we have a negative sign with? I don't think we did. We didn't. I'm changing it two ways, and we'll see where, that, where that's going to take shape, too. But in any case, consider the following path. I forgot that I did that, so this is kind of exciting. Um, in any case, all right, so we have a circle. We're centered at negative 2. Okay, and then we're going to consider the points who are two distance away from negative 2 and have a rotation e to the negative i t, okay, where t is going from 0 to 3 pi over 2. Okay, so let's plug in some points. Gamma of t, t. Okay, so we're going to start here at 0. So if we plug in 0, we're just going to get negative 2, um, plus 2, <clears throat> which is going to be right here at the origin. Okay, So our circle is starting here at the origin. Now let's plug in, let's say, pi over 2. And this is where things are going to get a little bit interesting. So if we plug in pi over 2, we're going to get negative 2 plus 2 e to the negative i times pi over 2. Okay, so now notice we have a negative sign there, right? So that doesn't mean that we're going up here like we would in the, uh, the books problem. We're actually going to rotate differently because of that negative sign. Remember, what do negative angles do? Negative angles rotate clockwise. So instead of going counterclockwise like this, we're actually going to go clockwise like this. So we'll be down here. Okay, so our curve is going to go like this. Okay. And I'm already started putting in that orientation there because, again, orientation is how is the curve flowing, right? So I'm going to put a little arrow here to show you that it's going this way. Okay. Now let's plug in another point. So we plug in pi. We'll get negative 2 plus 2e to the negative i pi. So that's going to land us over here. So that's the angle pi, right? And then finally at 3 pi over 2, we'll get minus 2 plus 2e to the negative. Uh, i, 3 pi over 2. And so that'll land us up here at the top. Okay, So notice a very, very simple tweak to your book's uh, path here it gave us sort of a very, very different circle, right? Actually, the same circle, just with a different orientation. Okay, So again, we're centered at negative 2. And now we're starting at the origin. Okay, And then we're going clockwise because of this negative sign here all the way up to 3 pi over 2. So that's giving us this nice, and here I'm going to change colors a little bit. OK, we start at the origin, and then we flow this way. Until we finally get up to here. OK, so orientation, though, just to, just to, um, just to summarize again. Orientation is just the direction that the path is moving. So just think about, OK, as time starts and then proceeds, where is your path moving? How is it flowing? All right, and that is it for chapter one. So um, we are going to get started in chapter two, and we're going to actually get into sort of the, the calculus of, of complex functions now. And we'll start talking about continuity, differentiability, which is sort of really crazy but awesome in complex land. Um, so I will see you all then.